the relation, the busy signal or traffic channel busy. That's term called blocking. So it's a job of the MTS to keep track of some of these things and re keep trying until it establishes a connection between the uh, call requested to the uh, uh, to receiving unit. So after a number of failed times, uh, busy tones can be requested or returned to the uh, to a given user to indicate that it's called in black because of traffic or congested traffic or busy signal channel within that particular receiving end. And it also handles call termination. Call termination is one of the functions that's been handled by MTSO. That's where users hang out and MTSO is well informed. Traffic channels are handed back uh, to uh, from, from base station are released back to MTSO to be used for other uh, uh, transmission calls. Uh, call drops also is also one key thing, one key function where base station cannot maintain required signal strength then call drops. So the question is how does this, how does MTSO handle that when it's a call drop? Well, if, if a device is completely going out of uh, signal strength and there's no uh, uh, base units that uh, the MTSO can handle the signal to, then it's the job of the MTSO to basically uh, uh, drop that call. So yeah, more or less drop that call uh, for that given transmission, at least until a different uh, uh, or until until the, the until the mobile unit gets into another into a much more another active um, cell unit where it has enough signal strength to carry on with the transmission. But call drops just cuts off the call anyways. So in other words, when call drops, you move moving on to a different cell. Then it's up to the other cell to uh, to identify you, and then when your call comes and you, you make the call again, it's up to that uh, particular cell unit and its MTSO uh, to reconnect the call to your original uh, uh, destination. So in this case, when that happens, there's a call drop. You have traffic channels are dropped, and MTSO is also informed about that. Calls to and from are fixed as well as remote from mobile subscribers. So it's also the job or the function, functionality of MTSO to connect to uh, PSTNs, you know, the, the public uh, uh, switch to the communication network to identify uh, that a given call is to a fixed network or it's out of its network. So you can identify the, uh, the uh, uh, the, the mobile units that out of out of its uh, network by connecting to the uh, public switching uh, telecommunication network to identify some of these units, so it can be relayed back to uh, back to the MTSO and creates that connectivity between two subscribing units or two mobile units. Okay, so the uh, call to and from are usually essential. Usually, when you are moving from your remote subscriber networks or fixed lines, then that's where you require to uh, either an MTSO is required to connect to a PT, uh, PSTN to uh, be able to handle calls that are not within its domain. MTSO can connect to mobile users and fixed subscribers via the PSTN. The PSTN. Um, MTSOs can connect to remote uh, other MTSOs via the P So if you think about it, uh, the public uh, social telecommunication network plays a huge role in connecting MT multiple MTSOs uh, across a vast region of interconnected uh, subscribers or service providers. It are via dedicated lines or other forms of uh, mediums. Uh, they can connect mobile users in uh, in areas that are remote. Uh, and uh, far away from um, uh, other subscriber units. So a uh, really crucial, you know, functionality is that MTSO plays uh, within a cellular network. Uh, so yeah, that should pretty much... Uh, 
wrap it up for the functionalities of the uh, Vertica single MTSO uh, role that we have. Uh, signaling is the next thing that we have to look at because uh, mobile radio propagations uh, uh, have got challenges. We're going to look at some of the challenges that comes with it. That's just what we look at fading and signal strength, interferences, uh, uh, call drops, and what have you. So we'll look at some of those real quick and see how they affect uh, cellular transmission. Okay. So signal strength uh, of um, of base stations and mobile units uh, needs to be strong enough to maintain signal facilities from and, and at various uh, receiving units. It's quite essential. If, if you don't have a good signal strength, uh, then mobile units and base station would have challenges trying to uh, uh, maintain uh, signal quality for, for, for transmission. Uh, if it's not strong enough, uh, the question is, do we need to create uh, code channel interference? If it's not strong enough, do we need to create um, other uh, transmission frequency channeling? Or what are some of the issues that might happen if the signals are not strong? And in this case, when the signal is not strong enough, it creates too much uh, code channel interferences, huge part interferences, creates a lot of interferences. So the signals, uh, the signal is not being strong enough to hold on to the uh, or maintain a quality signal between two mobile units within a given uh, uh, cell transmission. Noises might vary. Uh, automobiles, especially ignitions, noises can be greater in cities than in suburbs. So that creates a lot of more noises. So that challenges that you have with propagation of signal. Uh, here. If, let, me, let me go back to the propagation again. Propagation here means how signals or how radio waves uh, are uh, kind of like uh, transmit to the airwave because you will need the radio waves are what are carrying, are what are carrying uh, the signal, the information that we need uh, to have access to. Or that's creating that uh, more or less the link for devices, mobile units, so what exchange information. Okay, so if the signal is, is not strong enough, then you're gonna create you know, problems. One, and issues that can also lead to poor propagation within mobile or mobile radio uh, systems within cellular networks is, is strong uh, signaling can be caused, uh, sorry, noise can be one of the key things. And we talk about automobiles and coverage of cars creating noises can also affect the propagation of uh, radio waves. Okay, other signal source can also vary. Uh, these structures alone can also play a key role. Uh, signal strengths vary as functions of distance. Good, good point because this distance is creating a key issue with propagation of uh, uh, signaling. If the signal, if you're far away from a base unit. You might obviously have a, 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 a poor signal strength because the, the 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 signal strength of a base station is well calibrated based on the power needs that it has. And if 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 a device if a device is far off uh, within its power uh, capacity, then it's just, that obviously is going to translate uh, translate into uh, poor signal strength uh, for a given device to be sustained within a given base station or a given a given cell unit, um, and usually vary in uh, in, in, in various dynamic uh, forms when a device is actually moving. So you do have a number of challenges, especially when devices are moving. When you're moving around you're in your car. Or walking around, you're moving from base station to another, or going through various locations. Uh, signal strengths can 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 be the effect of signal propagation. It will be well can is well uh, 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 I mean, well felt. You know, like for instance, you're within a metropolis where you have sky high rise sky, uh, high rise buildings, skyscrapers, or whatever. 
and you're moving around within some of these high-rise buildings, a signal strength from a given base station might vary in dynamic ways, you know. So when movement within some of these locations comes into play, you 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 do sense that that uh, effect of uh, micro radio, sorry, mobile radio propagations a lot. Another one is fading, and I uh, effects from uh, mobile radio propagation is fading, and that's usually if uh, to give you good signal strength to be able to make calls or uh, exchange data needs or whatever on your devices. Okay, so that should be some of the key things you need to keep track of when you're using your mobile devices. Uh, design factors that goes into consideration to uh, to minimize the propagation effect. Uh, let's look at some of these real quick. Uh, we'll look at uh, dynamics. Uh, it's hard to predict. Usually, sometimes you can come up with the most dynamic uh, algorithm to 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 help manage uh, signal propagation, uh, but sometimes it's very difficult to predict and it becomes challenging. Uh, when you're within a, an environment with a number of elements that you can that are beyond your control or beyond your uh, management, you know. Uh, maximum transmission power level at base station or mobile unit can drop, you know. And when that happens, you need to uh, start thinking about what kind of design factors that you need to incorporate within your transmission. So at least you can address power levels uh, at particular locations where you find yourself uh, uh, struggling or the mobile devices find themselves struggling to maintain uh, signal propagation. Uh, so you either create maximum transmission levels for power for, for your base station or power for base stations. And then uh, you only use the minimum as and when uh, devices are within good coverage, and then when they're moving further or fading away, then you can either boost up the base in your power levels to maximum transmitting levels, so at least they can um, address some of those fading needs that comes up. So these are some of the design factors that we're looking at. You know, how do we improve challenges with propagation effects? And that's another one is typically. Um, uh, raising the height of a mobile unit antenna, either placing them on high-rise buildings, okay? Uh, usually when you place um, base antennas on a uh, high-rise building, uh, gravity kicks in automatically. It basically drives on the signal, so at least uh, coverages uh, within a given cell are well accommodated, or even when, dev when device or mobile units are moving within other uh, uh, hindrances or structures, uh, uh, it wouldn't be a problem because you get a signal propagating from the top of a given height. So it would just propagate across and it would basically eliminate objects that are going to be in the way of the signal propagation. Uh, this process you determine the size of individual cells and models are based on empirical data to identify how the design factors are going to be uh, put together and applying from applying models to a given environment also counts to develop guidelines for uh, cell sizes. So these are some of the uh, design factors that you need to put into consideration whenever you're building a, a, a what you might call it a, a whenever you're considering propagation effect of various mobile uh, uh, cell units and the uh, uh, signal propagation, signal propagation. Okay, uh, other factors are also in, 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 in uh, do come up, and that relates to more or less the uh, signal bouncing of structures. And I think we should look at that real quick too. Uh, so at least we know uh, design factors alone does not revolve around uh, just these uh, dynamic implementation. Dynamic, dynamic implementations or raising of uh, antennas on, 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 on higher grounds or higher structures or using models or empirical data. Okay, let's look at also some of the phases that you need to factor into your design 
uh, when it comes to uh, signal propagation. And that usually relates more on, on the multi-path in terms of how uh, signal propagates within uh, given geographical areas where there are hindrances or structures or other things or elements involved or play, the, play key roles within uh, that particular design. Reflection is one of them. Reflection plays a key role in uh, signal uh, design, tends to propagation. So reflection is when the surface uh, large relative to the wavelength of the signal. So when you have a surface that's too large uh, relatively to the wavelength of the signal being propagated, then you'd have reflection. They usually uh, may have phase shifts from the original signal or original uh, uh, transmission and it would cause uh, would call would cause for signal being cancelled you know out or either increased in its uh, in its uh, reflection okay so when you do have a reflection some of these things become out uh, propagation is either cancelled out from the original source or increased because you have the signal bouncing off uh, a larger surface relative to the wavelength that the signal is carrying. The other one is uh, diffraction, when the edges of uh, structures are highly impenetrable uh, by a given signal. So for instance, you do have a, a metallic structure or a, a big pillar within a given uh, 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 location of uh, signal propagation, you're gonna have refra sorry, diffraction. Uh, keep in mind that within physics, uh, let the signal radio waves um, cannot penetrate uh, thicker material, thicker objects of high impenetrable uh, structure, like a huge pillar. Uh, or a really uh, reinforced structure, uh, either metal base or concrete base, uh, signals are highly impenetrable within some of these structures. And when that usually happens, you have what you call a diffraction. So this is where signal may be received even if or no line of sight are uh, identified. So in that sense, uh, if signal were to diffract, then it could either be um, reflected somewhere or ref uh, refracted somewhere else to other devices that could create a line of sight or uh, might not even create a line of sight for a transmitter to uh, propagate a given signal transmission. So in other words, you could even use some of these beam structures or impenetrable bodies as a, as a way of uh, creating line of sight for transmitters, which is quite interesting if you think about it. Uh, I think if within 5G implementation, some of these have been looked at, how to use structures that you can't penetrate to, uh, to serve as a, uh, uh, a signal diffraction model to even uh, uh, improve transmission need for other mobile action scattering. So here is a diagram that illustrates refraction, diffraction, and scattering. So you do have a mobile unit that's propagating signals, bouncing off structures, uh, various um, uh, shapes and sizes or design. And the the form either, uh, so here we have, if a signal bounces off a structure, it can actually create a Good to uh, def, uh, reflect refraction for other devices that might be off balance or might not be within line of sight for a given mobile uh, unit. So this is where a line of sight or scattering or diffraction is playing a key role to, to help you know create coverage for other mobile units. Okay, and when that happens, you also do have scatterings. Okay, especially when you have a, a device right in the pathway of a given signal, signal is diffracted or is scattered across to a different location.
so assuming that maybe this signal coming from this mobile unit within this car was supposed to go straight up, hit the lamp post over here, then you create a, a more of a redirection of the signal. And that usually creates a, uh, a diffraction of whatever transmission uh, propagation is just required for, to sustain or maintain a given uh, uh, a mobile uh, transmission. Okay, so now moving on, we'll look at some of the third generation, some of the generations of uh, cellular networks that have uh, um, have come up over the years. The first generation cellular networks were purely analog. Uh, they usually they were originated as uh, as, uh, as as analog systems, you know, uh, where the telephone companies or the telephone networks depending heavily on that to address their transmission needs. So originally they were the cellular telephone network until uh, other implementation came up and they were purely analog, carrying analog traffic channels in back way back in the early 1980s. In the North American uh, environment, the advanced mobile phone servers uh, or the app, which is designed by, the, by at and was one of the first uh, first generation analog cellular network implemented, and that was it, for some time. It did, you know, play a key role in handling uh, cellular transmission by cellular network by telephone networks, you know, called the amps. Uh, it was also a huge part within um, uh, places like uh, South Af South America, Australia, and China. They, they have to use that back when it was implemented. So when at and came up with the first generation cellular network, which was purely analog, it was adapted by some of these regions as well. Uh, so AMP was adapted by a number of regions within the world to, to also, you know, handle the uh, uh, inception of a cellular network. Obviously with time, we know that a lot of other new designs have come up over the years. Okay, and within the so since it was purely analog back then, uh, spectral location was a key part in making sure that uh, uh, the uh, the implementation for AMP really uh, address you know first generation cellular needs and. To look at that in, in, in a bit brief uh, uh, illustration, we'll look at uh, how they were allocated and its limitations that came up. So usually two uh, frequency bands were used or were allocated for amps. They, they were using a 25 megahertz band where they allocated two um, radio spectral bands that were allocated for the amp services. One was used by a base station to mobile units, which was within the uh, 869 to 894 megahertz. Uh, and then the other was from the mobile units to the base station, which was covering the 824 to 849 uh, megahertz uh, range. So there were two main 25 megahertz band frequencies that were allocated within the spectrum. Keep in mind we had a li limited frequency spectrum, right? Yeah, so they had bands within it and the bands had their own heads or frequency units that you could use for transmission uh, needs. And within the first generation, two bands were allocated and they fall within the 869 to 894 megahertz, which addresses uh, base station to mobile unit. And then from the mobile unit to handset, it was using the 824 to 849 uh, megahertz. So you can address transmission from base station to mobile devices and from mobile devices to uh, base station. Uh, bands uh, was split in two to encourage uh, competition. So uh, each market two operators can be uh, accommodated. So if you had two operators within a given market, you could they could easily 
address uh, transmission need for the first generation uh, mobile transmission. Operators were allocated only 12.5 megahertz uh, channel each for directional transmission, and channels were spaced from 30 kilohertz apart, uh, with a total of four 16 channels per operator. So there were not by then there were not that many operators within uh, 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 solar networks like we have today, where you have multiple ISPs or operators providing a number of uh, mobile service or solar solar services to subscribers. And then within the first generation, it was limited. It was just two frequency bands that were allocated, and it was allocated to the highest, you know. Uh, ends of the spectrum operators, but my guess would probably be the the national operators and 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 then maybe a, a private end that could afford the the license, you know. Uh, so twenty one channels allocated for controls with uh three hundred ninety five to to carry calls. Control channels uh were of ten kilobits per second data channel channelings. And conversations for channels carry analog using frequency modulations. So you were not even incorporating any of the digital uh, encoding schemes at the time because it was purely analog. So they were much more uh, reliant on modulation. You know, if you go back to your signal encoding and modulation, you notice that within analog transmission was purely uh, modulation. That was the uh, key way to. Uh, handle encoding or or manage modulation of uh, transmission. Numbers of uh, channels were inadequate for most major markets. Yes, obviously for various regions uh, because of the limited uh, number of uh, spectrum allocation that we had. So for arms, uh, frequency reuse uh, had to be exploited. So make sure we could address because that's all, yeah, that's that was one of all the options they had. In terms of addressing capacity needs, so those were some of the uh, limitations that came up within the first generation um, solar network implementation. So, in a nutshell, these were the limitations that came up with, and this was the initial uh, reason, initial implementation, and how these became a limitation down the line. The second generation solar networks were designed to be more digital based, uh, or what you call the 2G, and they were either more the uh, the early stage of digital transmission, or you really were using most of the uh, digital encoding te techniques. And uh, they were actually developed to address um, uh, higher quality signal needs higher data rates, support of digital services, and also creates uh, greater capacity. Within digital traffic channels, they also support digital data, voice uh, traffic digitization, uh, user traffic for data or digitized voice were also converted to analog signal for transmissions that needed uh, uh, higher user traffic needs. Encryption was a key part of it because if you, the very moment you dive into digital transmission, uh, you have to think about how to avoid eavesdropping. Uh, with the first generation, okay, one thing I need to point out over here is that uh, one of the limitations of or challenges that came up with the, within the first generation analog uh, cell network was eavesdropping because uh, it was peel analog, so anybody could eavesdrop into a conversation easily. Uh, and that was a huge problem. The sensitive information uh, were not secured enough. But when it came to second generation, encryption, since it was digital, encryption had to be adapted and uh, incorporated into the transmission or into the, uh, the network. So encryption was from simple to uh, much more complex uh, trans uh, encryptions were adapted for digital traffic to make sure they were much conversations were much more secure. Um, uh, error detection and correction measures were also in place. Uh, 
this was actually covered in chapter six of the textbook. Uh, so we can address uh, much, much clearer voice receptions. Okay, so if you want to look at the